are live. From the industrial wastelands of Michigan to the fruited plains of Iowa, this is live the American Green You are the dead. Remain exactly where you are. Make no move until you are ordered. We burn them to ashes and then burn the ashes. That's our official motto. Now we can see you. Clasp your hands behind your head. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Who can explain the fascination of fire? What draws us to it? Whether we are young or old. Here comes the candles who light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop up your head. And welcome to the American Greed Factory Podcast, the, the return. <laughs> it's not, not been that long, but it seems like it's been forever. So, Welcome to the show. This is Nathan. This is Common. Andrew. Yeah, we're all back after uh, some some harrowing days. Uh, well, not for any of us, but uh, for some, some people. Who are you waving at? Oh, the people that aren't watching us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Our, our rabid fan base. Well, I I've, I realized like uh, I have like you because know, I haven't figured out how to switch this stuff over and oh. I have to do it manually and like I have uh, I, when I said our names I, I should have like switched to me so I you see me saying my name and then see Andrew saying his name because he's he's also he's like in a third corner that you can't even see. <laughs> I want people just to think I'm a very talented ventriloquist. <laughs> like, he's doing this show all by himself. Those other people don't exist. But see his lips don't move when they talk. You never noticed that well, we people don't... used to think about it like that when we just had audio versions, like, like when oh, they just listen to podcasts, it's like it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like you just they just it sounded like we were just talking, to, somebody was talking to themselves. <laughs> yeah. Welcome <clears throat> to the schizophrenia hour. Yeah, yeah, that was a problem. I think I, I made some changes where our voices do sound. At least when I listen to it, of course I can tell. But well, we have different mics now, so yeah. Well, I mean, mine runs deep. I don't think my voice is this deep in real life, or it's close to it. But I just yeah, constantly but... sound like I have a cold, so that's how yeah. you tell my difference. I think everybody thinks their voice doesn't sound exactly like it does if you hear it back in recording or through somebody else. Because I don't think my voice sounds as deep as it does when I hear it back on record, and it's always deeper. So I oh, you th- okay? Because I always feel like it's the opposite. Uh, because like you're closer to your voice and like uh, your voice kind of like reverberates in your bones when you talk. I feel like you would, I feel like I imagine my voice is deeper than it is. Hmm. And then you hear it in recording. He's like, Oh, I guess it isn't. <laughs> well, it's not like you're talking and then it's like, you're sucking helium. Where it's like, I'm <laughs> welcome to the podcast. <laughs> people tell me my voice. Some people tell me my voice is insanely deep. And then, I'll meet someone who who is is, is, is like hello. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude has a fucking deep voice. Because like, one of the firemen here was uh, they do that thing where you fill the boot for charity or whatever, and he's yeah. this tall black guy. He's one of our local firemen, and he's like, fill the boot, fill. The boot. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow! Dude. I even told him I said you ought to sing with that shit. I said because it's just really. <laughs> Not only is it deep and loud, but because they're doing it in front of the grocery store, it's like projecting. <laughs> so you can be all the way at the other end of the parking lot. Build <laughs> Holy shit. So I always give him money because he has a unique voice. Uh, he's not ringing a bell or something. He's actually you know, doing something. You know, if I was jacking off into a shoe in that parking lot, I would be like, it's a sneaker, not a boot. <laughs> I cannot possibly fill it. Uh, of all the scenarios, I... <laughs> It's like, yeah, don't. <laughs> okay, mister. <laughs> Stop that now. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> don't fill the boot with semen. Fill it with money for the children. Not semen. Not- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I imagine there's always somebody in a parking lot somewhere jerking off into a shoe. <laughs> it has to have happened. Anymore. I mean, for God's sakes, there's actual porn where people just like park in places and try to masturbate as quick as they can. So, I mean, (laughs) and other people watch that. Gumball Rally (laughs) Jerk Off Edition. (laughs) 
Fast Whack 2000. <laughs> who's, who's this year's champion? I won! <laughs> Nobody well, I mean, wins. More of, like, I think they don't want to get caught type of thing, even though like the women that do it and shit like that, because I clicked on a couple of them, because I was like, this is really fucking weird. It's just like them going like, people are going to find me any minute. It's like, so don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, There's a for this. <laughs> go, to, go to your house. <laughs> like, I don't this know. is the only way I can get to heaven. <laughs> yeah. It's oh. like, okay, apparently your kink is being discovered in a shopping mall parking lot by somebody who, while you have your top down and you got your finger half or your fingers halfway for pussy. Like I don't like I don't fucking see how that's a thrill, but okay. Oh, there's just everyone's nuts is the problem. I I don't think that's a large populace <laughs> that <laughs> people that are doing that. Yeah, but it's if it's more than one person it's speaks at the failure of the structure of our civilization i don't know now now it's uh, you know with the internet it's like things that used to be uh just a shitty rumor in high school now people are just attempting to do those things yeah i don't know if the camp is really there or people are just wanting to like live the adventure. <laughs> I could never never quite could figure it out because ever uh, they, Ever until like the what was it? like I heard Uki Cookie and Jizz Kit, and it's like this thing is like you know there's like there'd be like some sleepover or something like last guy to jerk off on the cracker has to eat it and like that has been like I've listened to many podcasts and everybody has their own variation like in this like kind of before the internet uh, these people like when they were in high school and like there's like this variation of it like nobody's ever fucking done that but somehow yeah. that rumor has spread across America. <laughs> Yeah, to try, all middle schools and high schools. I try to put myself in the scenario uh, when I hear stories like the yeah the the cookie and everything that it's the last guy to finish this has to eat it. There is nothing in my young life where anyone could ever coerce me to eat anything covered with semen. I'm just like I'm not gonna. This is not my party. I'm out of here. Like no one wants to belong that bad. Or if they do, well, it's just fun to watch. But. But yeah, that, that, but that's just like one of those things where people make it up and nobody actually like does it. But then yeah, it becomes, no. but because the rumor becomes so pervasive, people think people are doing it. It's like you know, like you know, Alabama hot pocket and all those weird oh, things. Okay. And it's like nobody's doing this. It's just it's somebody's imagination in, in caught see, fire. And see, Nathan, I thought you were gonna go with no one's gonna make me jizz on a cracker. It's gonna be someone's face, breast. <laughs> it's not gonna be a cracker. That's just the meaning. Like I said, there's a lot of coercive power in this world, but as a teenager getting drunk at a party, if, like, jerking off and eating something ever came into the mix, it's like, I don't want to get drunk this bad. Um, you know, that's... Uh... Now, weird, pervy sex stuff with a bunch of boys and girls, yeah, I absolutely am sure that's going on, but nobody's going to, like, eat the jizz cracker unless there's <laughs> $10,000 at the other end of it or... It's some kind of jackass thing where it's like they don't really care anyway. They just want to see, like, what won't he do? Oh, he <laughs> there's nothing he won't do. He's our Steve-O. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, I love some of these stories about, oh, they made this girl, like, eat her own shit. It's like, no, they didn't. Nobody would do that. <laughs> Unless they were fucking lunatics to begin with. But people will take other people's shit and shut up their own ass. <laughs> in terms of well, having better metabolism so where do you draw the line huh that's a that's a thing that's now not people... a kink? well it's not a kink but <laughs> well it's... it could be both <laughs> <laughs> for your health <laughs> i mean two girls one cup is real so i mean uh... yeah but that's yeah, but it's people getting paid to do things to degrade yeah, them like adults degrading themselves <laughs> yeah that's like uh, and i don't even know how real that was because the one girl shit like it was soft serve ice cream. It's like I've never seen one shit like that before. So God knows what they put in there, like Cool Whip and turds. I don't know. <laughs> that was the only one of the only video videos that I've thought like, <coughs> where I actually sat down and watched it, and I was like, I was truly impressed at the horror of it. <laughs> then I'd have eggs like Phil Cooper. You got to see this shit. No way. It's like you can't watch this. You're not going to be able to get through this. Ah, that shit doesn't bother me. It's like, oh yeah, this this will fucking this covers all the worst shit you could imagine. 
and then come to find out that was like a series of movies from South America. Like that, that was like part three of, <laughs> it's like, Oh my God, there's, this wasn't like a hundred thousand dollars worth of cocaine one off. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, uh, an anthology here. Of, <laughs> there's a through line. line. Do they, yeah. Do, do they do the first movie? Like people are really eating this up. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have to really turn these out. Yeah, but I never watched. I know there were other ones that were supposed to be equally as bad, but I was like, I don't want to feel that way again. I'm not gonna watch that. Who wants to fucking watch? Might more. as well just be jerking off to beheading videos. <laughs> yeah, just, just fire up some ISIS and fucking dissolve the pilot in acid and film it, and I'll just jerk off to that because at that point you've lost your mind. <laughs> I've only watched a few of those ISIS videos, and, and some of that stuff is like, oh, they really did that. They just fucking did that, huh? That is, uh, that still goes on in the 21st century. But, yeah. I think the worst one was when they had the, the Jordanian fighter pilot in the cage, and they lit a fire under him and just filmed the, fi- the cage was over the fire, like on a chain, and they just lit, the, lit a fire under him and filmed the whole thing. I mean, I watched like a minute or two of it, and I was like, okay, I think I know where the story's going. But it was like, holy shit, these people. Who does this? I mean, yeah, crazy people and ISIS. and ISIS is like the, what do they say, that the bug light for sociopaths and murderers around <laughs> the world. It's, you know, people sh- like Jeffrey Dahmer, people show up. So I got to swear loyalty to Allah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> In the most gruesome way possible. Bring me my art sculpture. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really here to... Uh, whatever whatever your caliphate is, go ahead, great. I just want to hurt people in an unlimited way. Oh, and throwing the homosexuals off the roof. That was pretty... pretty, And that made it on... A censored version of that was on CNN. Because they'd like grab these guys and hug them. And be like, I'm sorry, I'm doing this for you, though. It's better this way like and the guys that were throwing them off were genuinely crying and upset but they yet they threw them off of a fucking building for being gay and filmed it is like wow that is oh that's next level crazy there when you're just this is what we're doing but at least it's not happening here here we well our version of that is florida (laughs) whatever's going on down there Uh, yeah but lots of stuff going on down yeah, there's a there was a wrestler that was on uh, a giant bomb feature the other day and uh he works for NXT and like the NXT their uh their base is in Florida. Clearwater? No. Cuz that's WWE something. WWE? Yeah, that's in Clearwater, right? Oh, it is. Okay, I thought it was like Maybe. in Orlando or something, but same place as Scientology wherever that is. I've heard like pro yeah. wrestling Scientology are in the same city. Wherever Full Sail University is, because that's where they film their show in Florida. Okay. Uh, Let that, me use this. That's a for-profit engine. college. So. <laughs> What's it called? Full Sail University. That sounds really scammy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a for-profit college, so it's just total bullshit. Um, yeah, but somebody's getting ahead there, but, you know, everybody else is just giving, baking people millionaires. <laughs> Winter Park, Florida. <clears throat> Oh, it's not even accredited? Oh, it's nationally accredited. Never heard of that. It's got a picture of a plane for its mascot. Yep. But yeah. Oh, a film school. It's yeah. film school and video game design. Okay, so they're not teaching like uh, Elizabethan poetry. No. Um, but yeah, that's where they get some. I get, I'm assuming that's where they get some of their crew and camera stuff for the show. <laughs> Okay. And if not, it's just <laughs> it's just a place for the old. Uh, anyway, so because uh, there's going to be an NXT UK, and I was talking about how like because uh, they're doing a lot of international kind of recruiting of of wrestlers, and that could make more sense to send people to the UK from all over the world rather than Florida, <laughs> right? And so like so this guy is uh, he's from his, his, I'm not sure his real name is, but it's, he's gentleman Jack Gallagher. <laughs> That's his wrestling persona, and uh, he said his first week in Florida, like it was just you know like revenge fires. There was a uh, pregnant lady who, whose boyfriend shot her in the face, and she lived. <laughs> uh, just uh, tons of drug addicts and everything. It's like, yeah, welcome to Florida. That's your first week. <laughs> this sounds like Florida. <laughs> oh 
boy. That's crazy. Um, no, nothing comes out of Florida as normal. <laughs> it's too hot down there. That's why God sends all the hurricanes. He's trying to cleanse them all, but it never works. Well, it's going to sink. They, <laughs> well, that, like Barrett, Barrett's from Florida. I need to get him on the podcast sometime because I need him to just explain Florida to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about it. I don't think I've ever been there. At least I can never remember being there. And uh, But I just hear I – mean, I'm sure maybe it's a wonderful place, but it's like I never hear anything good. The only it's always the weirdest stuff and then even the stuff that's like not weird it, it's like the oh like casey anthony the kid the lady whatever happened to her kid remember that the hot mom whose kid they just found her dead in a swamp and she was the one who got off yeah yeah it's it's like that she just seemed like such a typical story from down there only the only unique hook to it was like oh there's a dead kid it's like yeah this is horrible these are crazy, irresponsible, weird people. Her parents seem like weird people, and her dad was a cop. So it's like, what a weird place. It just seems like a weird place. Yeah, I can't it's remember. Normal to live in a place where there's no seasons. I can't remember that there's like some. Well, they'll come at random. Like it'll suddenly, it'll randomly snow in Florida on occasion. Yeah. Just because. Um. But uh. I can't remember what it was. Like something big happened in Florida. Like I don't know, like a kid was eaten by an alligator. And yeah, then, and that, that was it. Yeah, that made the news for like three days. And then like while the news was down there covering that, trying to scare everybody about alligators or whatever, uh, or is it crocodiles? I, I can remember. Alligator. That's alligator. Okay, one of those things. <clears throat> um, and uh, so yeah, they kept. So, like, while the national news media was down there, they just kept, like, all these other news stories were popping up. And they're like, well, I guess we should report on this. I guess we should report on this. And just so much strange, weird shit kept happening that the national news just got bored with it and left. Like, they're... These people are trying. <laughs> yeah, the, the entire state of Florida is just auditioning for the news. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> Florida, year-round fear factor. Yeah. Pretty much. America's got no talent. Uh, like, I don't... Well, yeah, I tried to, like, uh, I tried to assess it one time. And, uh, um, as, because you have, there's no sales tax down there. So, you know, your a dollar goes a bit longer down there. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, you know, it, there can be good weather and then suddenly terrible weather. But there can be good weather. Um, but also there's just like a contingent of retired old people down there with money. So there's opportunity for theft (laughs) and also just an unrelenting, uh, drug stream down there. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like everyone's like, you're not on drugs. You're not a citizen. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it just seems because there's the jobs that exist down there are just mostly uh sorry mostly tourism and hospitality yeah there's not a lot of manufacturing there's not a lot of anything besides no. just lower page lower inc- or lower skilled jobs so you have like you said you got a lot of people older people that retire down there with money you got a lot of people that don't make any money trying to support drug habits <laughs> that, they, that they shouldn't have in the first place and there's nothing worse than having a drug habit with a low wage job. <laughs> it's going to throw a lot of barricades at you. That you know, got to get into the high wages. You're first. constantly getting hit by severe weather. It's always hot and muggy down there. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. It's always hot and muggy. So it's like the most miserable weather <laughs> that you can. Well, no, it's yeah. occasionally beautiful weather. That's why people go down. And then there. you can't even really go for a swim because you might get attacked by an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. just yeah, just swim in the ocean or the the golf. Don't swim in don't swim in someone's backyard. Well, no, because they've got the shit now that eats your skin off and poisons all the shellfish. That that algae shit that, that's all down there uh, on the sea end in an in inland. Uh, yeah, it just doesn't seem like a place for me. Not interested. Right, minus twenty, cool. I'm down with that. Let's do that for. <laughs> At least all these insects are dying. Yeah. <laughs> you scourge the land of, li- of life. 
No, actually, that minus 20, minus 30 shit is insane. I don't like that either. I don't like it when I'm watching TV and I look at my, like, sliding door, glass door, and I see frost, like, slowly creeping up inside. It's like, oh, this <laughs> is fucking cold. <laughs> or when I used to smoke, it's like, I'm going to go stand in the garage and smoke a cigarette and just crack the garage. In the garage, trying to smoke a cigarette in five minutes, my hand feels like I held it in a fire and it's like oh this is crazy cold i don't know how people do this in some places it's like this for weeks and months but i think you always have wood burning or something or you start wearing animal furs all the time so something right because they talked about like on the weather forecast here in iowa a couple days ago when i have the radio on like oh it's gonna be cold today and it's only a high of 59 we're like oh at least around north dakota the high there today is 20 and like high winds and possibility of snow and it's like holy fucking shit it's only fucking like beginning of october i'm like what the fuck and i mean i don't think anybody really likes negative 20 or negative 30 weather because yeah it does suck and you can't really do anything you're kind of trapped but at the same time the whole statistics of people live longer in colder climates and they have better more affordable life well there's less chance of disease getting you <laughs> well yeah <laughs> People the love. malaria kills a lot of people around the equator. <laughs> well, it's not so much that. I think it's just the you have a better quality of life because nobody's scrambling and driving up real estate prices to live in fucking Grand Rapids, Michigan, and freeze their ass off half the year. What they're like, people flock to the coast where it's temperate climate and it's fucking hot, so you just kind of sit and wither away all year, and you don't really have. Any change of seasons, you don't have to work all year. You might have to mow your lawn, but you don't have to, like, shovel snow, rake leaves, do a bunch of different variety of work that keeps you active and, I don't know, strengthens your immune system from the cold and shit, too. I'm always impressed by Canada because I'm like, it's cold here, but that entire country is above us. (laughs) (laughs) Very cold. (laughs) Very, very fucking cold. Well, it's like the mall is, uh, was it the mall? Is it in Quebec? Where to walk between the stores, you go underground <laughs> because you wouldn't, you'd fucking freeze to death while just walking across. The, they don't have like the above ground promenade, like outside. They do in the summer, but in the winter, it's like they have heated passages. Like you, if you go from one store to another, because it's, it's like crazy. I mean, we go above Quebec to test our diesel tr- engines when they proof them out. Because that's like the coldest fucking place in North America. Um, you just, you know, go out, start the engine, let it run for five minutes, shut it off, don't plug it in, don't put the, the you know, we want to see how many times it'll start and stop and under those conditions. And it, that's in, insane up there. Because it, when you have that sustained like minus 35, minus 40, like that's the end of life. That's like, <laughs> that's like the surface of Mars shit. You know, it, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. A lot oh, there. of very thick, well-heated buildings. That reminds me of a show I suddenly found and watched all of it <laughs> really quickly. What's that? The First. It's a show okay. on Hulu about the first like uh, manned mission to Mars. Oh, okay. Uh, starring Sean Penn. Oh, shit. Who got fucking jacked for this fucking... Well, I guess he got jacked for The Gunman. Which was okay. a movie he did a couple of years ago, but yeah, he's a he's fucking jet. He's in the he's like fifty eight and in the best shape of his life. It's fucking oh. weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was uh uh, yeah, I just I I guess I liked more of it for the uh, idea of it, but it was actually kind of a poor season. Cause I, I got done with it and I was like, "Hey, that was kind of cool." And then I watched all the hate pour in for the fucking series. And I'm like, "Ah, I guess they're all right." <laughs> I sort it, of liked it. Wait, oh no, maybe the weight of opinion says this sucks. Well, no, like, well, like the thing I like, I'd like kind of just like, uh, you know, my attention would sway right from because, like, what I would like, what this kind of does, what I'd like is like, here's like the Martian, but like before all that happens. Oh, okay. And so you, what you want to see is like, uh, what was that? Remember that one HBO show about like, you know, the was it from here to the moon or something like that? It was okay. a mini series on HBO about like, you know, the whole space. Uh, oh, uh, Moonshot? No, no, it was like it was a mini series. Oh, was, okay. It was like Tom Hanks was producer, and and so was uh, 
fucking Opie, Ron Howard. Uh, I think it's called like From Here to the Moon or something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, like what you want to see is like yo, know, the trials and tribulation of sending humans to Mars. And then, uh, so you get some of that in the first few episodes, and then like the whole middle is about like uh, this guy's drug addict daughter. <laughs> Which you don't give a shit about. It's like, I want to see people go to Mars. I don't give a shit that she can't handle her eye. <laughs> uh, Sean Penn's good in it. So like, but, and I, uh, like, I like the promise of it. Like, I hope there's a second season. Cause, uh, you know, spoilers, the fucking end of the show is them on the way to Mars. So the whole show is just getting them up in space to go to Mars. <laughs> they don't actually go to Mars in the first season. Oh, okay. Which that's where that's where it would get interesting because that in that way, like unless they did flashbacks or shit, there there would be no way to uh, kind of do the shitty part of the show where it gets over dramatic and be more of the uh, you know problem solving stuff, which was I like. But you know, if you get Sean Penn, he probably wants some melodramatic shit to handle. So he probably I don't know. yeah probably isn't really like worried about like how do we grow potatoes on Mars? <laughs> like no, how does this affect my feelings? <laughs> Yeah. Maybe that's who forced the drug addict daughter into the half of the season. He's like, my character needs to feel conflicted somehow. Yeah. And maybe his dog, his uh, dog, his dog be a drug addict. <laughs> That'd be a more interesting subplot. It's like, my rat terrier, Thomas, he really likes the cocaine. I can't get him off of it. He keeps biting people and trying to, you know, kill old ladies for cocaine. I don't even know who's giving him the cocaine. <laughs> I just, he's using it. <laughs> I just know he's on it. Oh, did you guys see that art sculpture that was popular on the internet this week? What's that? Uh-huh. It was a giant table with white sand or white powder on it and a giant nose vacuum that went across the thing. <laughs> it was just called, like, the... I can't remember what the title, but it was just Cocaine Something. But it was just somebody in a modern art museum put that as a modern art piece. It's just a giant nose doing cocaine on a table endlessly. Oh, okay. I don't know why. You know, for shits and giggles. Yeah. It would seem like something, uh, uh, fuck, what's the guy's name? Is it Joel Hodgman? The guy who made Mystery Science Theater? Yeah. It seemed like something he would make. Joy's other famous. Uh, it's model. John Hodgman. Joel, it's Joel something. Shit. I can't uh, yeah. I can't think of his name. Oh. Let's see. Uh, Anthony Hopkins had something cool I've watched a little bit of. Oh, is, the is it the yet. Amazon series? Yeah, King Lear. Yeah. It's just a two-hour two movie. Um, oh, it's a movie? Oh, okay. I thought it was like a yeah. show. It's that weird kind of Shakespeare futurism where it's set like in the 21st century, but it's the plot of King Lear. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's Anthony Hopkins. It's great, but it's it's, it's strange. It Because they do that, I think, to compress the, the story i'm not sure because there's a few things they seem to leave out but they got the meat of the story so far but yeah it's one of those it was like Coriolanus. remember that one no that uh, ralph fines did no it was like a it was like a uh it was a shakespeare play it was one of his lesser known ones but yeah well, i'm kind of i kind of think of well what comes to my first is the the uh, baz lerman romeo and juliet <laughs> yeah this isn't that bad but, uh, well, no, that was that. No, that was good. I mean, and I don't know. I mean, it was bad in some way, but it was like really great production and an interpretation, yeah. an interesting ter- interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. You have fucking guns that say dagger on it, and the weird fucking cars that they got. <laughs> I like gangster cars. Uh, uh, you know, it was very. Uh, it looked really nice, but it's also just you know, and, you know, it was of its time. It was very like, what would MTV turn Romeo and Juliet into? It was yeah, like, it was a very '90s vibe to it. Um, I also remember there was a uh, Richard the Third. They did something like that with the guy who plays uh, uh, Ian McKellen. It was set like in a World War Two because that's when Robert Downey Jr. gets killed. Like he just shows up, he's completely blasted out of his mind on drugs, and he says three lines and he gets stabbed with a sword. <laughs> um, that was like set in a World War One setting for a Shakespeare. Huh. I remember there was this Ethan Hawke one. I'm trying. To, it, might, it might have been Macbeth, but like you know, it was just like a modern day um, take on Macbeth. 
which I really like the soundtrack to. I wouldn't necessarily say the movie's that great, but <laughs> Ethan Hawke's fine in it. Then there was one, that guy who has that series, uh, what's his name? Liv Schreiber did a Shakespeare, but it was set. It was a Shakespeare play, but it was set in New York City in modern times. And it was Shakespearean dialogue. And they were talking about big things, but they were just like a bunch of lonely people. And they were living really small lives. It wasn't like they were kings or something, but they were playing at like there was this drama playing out. And it was all this Shakespearean dialogue, but it was basically people that lived in an apartment in New York. <laughs> it was interesting. It was weird. Well, Josh, this, we did the yeah. same thing with like a, people in a house in California. Yeah, much ado about nothing. Is that yeah. what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like in between shooting the Avengers, he basically got everybody in the Avengers and his old people from like Buffy, uh, and Angel. Buffy and Angel to like come in and make this movie in like two weeks. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I think it's black and white, isn't it? Yeah, it's black and white. I've never actually seen it. I just know about it. I watched it. I can't say I remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cool. I mean, it's great dialogue but it's a lot of like close camera where you can tell it was done quickly yeah like a lot of close tight shots and people delivering dialogue like great actors and um but yeah this was a uh, i mean anthony hopkins is just fun to watch it's uh because one of my favorite anthony hopkins movies was the weird uh the one where titus he, uh, titus agrippa yeah, yeah that was the, that, that was tell really my nothing, sorrows to the stones <laughs> you know there was really nothing awesome about that movie except him and the weirdness of it it had a good that, look to it yeah i can't remember who directed it but she did she did a lot like of paper? yes she did a lot of uh broadway stuff so like it had a had a really cool look to it and good costume designs but it was kind yeah. of just uh a weird movie <laughs> Yeah, it didn't hold. I mean, it held your interest if you liked watching Anthony Hopkins do grim Shakespearean dialogue, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't exactly uh, cut people's throats and make pies out. Yeah. <laughs> and it had a lot of good uh, good actors in it. So I know the guy, one of the guys from the Americans, was he looked like he was like fifteen in it. <laughs> I think that was made in the late 90s or something yeah yeah, yeah i think 2000 maybe yeah because i think i was because it was like a double dvd so i think it was like around the dvd boom when that got made yeah and i know that what's his name was a producer an executive producer on it the oh the head propagandist for trump uh the guy who ran breitbart and then got fired mm. oh the alcoholic dude manafort no, the other guy, the advisor guy, the guy who ran uh, oh, Bright. Steve Park. Bannon. Yeah, yeah, Steve Bannon was a producer on that movie. <laughs> That's weird. Well, he was always trying to uh, be in movies before he became a propagandist. I mean, I don't know what being a producer on a movie entails. So. Uh, it's it so could, it could be nothing or everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he just procured some funding and. Yeah, usually, like, executive producers is usually kind of a funding thing. Yeah. Um, like, actual producers is basically people who are trying to keep all the shit together so they can just film. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we need a tank for the set. Go to the producer. <laughs> Make us a tank or secure us a tank. But, yeah, King Lear, I'm about, I'm about a quarter of the way into it. It looks kind of cool. I like Shakespeare though, so I always like, and I always, and I like Anthony Hopkins, so it's like two things I like together. <laughs> I haven't finished it either. It was actually a role he was afraid of doing for a long time. Huh. Why was that? Because uh, that, I don't know. How did he? Well, he's the act, he's the expert. He's the actor. So the way he described it is, it's kind of a role that can you can fuck up the King Lear role pretty easy. Because essentially what he is is he's a man who's dying. He's coming to the end of his reign. There's a civil, there's a war with France. And uh, this is the, I don't, I don't know if in the show if they talk about that or not. But anyway, he has three daughters. And he's going to divide his kingdom three ways. Um, because that's going to be like the last thing he does because he knows his reign is about to end. And one of his daughters, like, she's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this. I, I don't I don't love you, Father. I don't I don't want your riches. I'm because each of his daughters has to make a declaration about how 
uh, you know, they love him and he's doing the right thing and his third daughter refuses to do it. And he basically torments her <laughs> the whole time. But he's a very emotionally unstable king. He's, he's, as a man, he's emotionally unstable. And uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to play that character because you want to be seen as the antagonist in the story or the pro you know the yeah you want to be the main character and then you want to also antagonize the three daughters and because he plays them off each other he's a very manipulative guy but basically anthony hopton said king lear can get away from the trees <laughs> go in the wrong direction uh because you're playing a good guy bad guy uh an evil man and a man you're supposed to feel sorry for and it's 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 hard to do that, that reminds me of a quote i heard about uh nicholas cage huh uh, I guess he, Roger Deber was saying Nicolas Cage is like one of the greatest actors ever. Yeah. <laughs> and like the quote is like, because he's the only person willing to like go out on a branch and cut it off while he's out there. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like Nicolas Cage. <laughs> so recently I saw a Nick Cage movie that was pretty good compared to all the other trash director, <laughs> director Redbox stuff he usually does. Okay. I saw Mandy. Yeah, oh, the, heard that was the guy's good. name, something Cosmo, something yeah. the guy over the black rainbow, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Which I haven't seen that movie. I just saw the trailer for it and I was like, it's oh. incoherent mess, but it's cool. Okay. It's that's, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The Mandy's right there. Okay. <laughs> this is the one with the cheddar goblin I've been hearing. So much. Yes. Yes. Pat Oswalt likes been, he's been all over that fucking cheddar goblin on Twitter for, well, it was a couple of weeks ago, but yeah. The guy who made that commercial is the same guy who did the too many cooks thing for Adult Swim. Okay. And it's only like it's like a it's like a it's like maybe like half a minute in the movie. But it it's like an ad on TV and it's kind of breaks between the ad and Nick Cage's face and then the ad. And... Yes, and it happens after a very tumultuous and horrible moment for him, his character. Okay. And then Cheddar Goblin comes on the TV and and he's like, he has like a, a cut on his side. He's bleeding all over the place. And he just like mumbles towards the TV. Cheddar Goblin. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds a little more approachable. Than... <laughs> uh, I'm have to watch this. Uh, I mean, it's just basically a drug-fueled revenge movie. <laughs> okay. That's but... <laughs> life, actually. Uh, and it's like, it's almost like a heavy, it's, there's even like, uh, cartoon sequences that just basically are heavy metal but this uh, is almost like a heavy metal type story okay i gotta watch this um but yeah it's incoherent but it's it's still fun just stylish and weird <laughs> yes okay well it's uh well it's the thing I, I found out recently the uh where it's a lot of a lot of uh where it's kind of has the you know the 80s look thing where it's like a dark background and like bright neon and that okay. contrast. And I, I've learned that what that's called is called vaporwave. Vaporwave. Okay. So it kind of has a vaporwave kind of look to it. Huh. Uh, they t and I read it in the trivia. There's like a lot of uh, where it looks kind of like weird and washed out and red. And it's like it, apparently you achieve that effect by just shining a laser like right into the camera <laughs> i like to do that <laughs> many lasers in the camera <laughs> so yeah I, I mean i heard a lot of people talk about it and people are I mean, even i am uh saying it's too good than it actually is but you you won't forget it after you see it <laughs> okay yeah I, I uh over the black rainbow was like that yeah, and like I found out, like that guy, like he made that movie like six years ago. So it's weird that you know six mo six years between movies, and there's this random just kind of this buzz around it that pa happened. Panos Cosmatos. Yep, he is an Italian Canadian film director. That's funny. When I heard him interviewed, he didn't have didn't sound Italian at all. But okay, I heard. That. <laughs> so I guess uh, his dad his dad directed Tombstone. Uh, okay. He's directed other movies, but I think that was his dad's biggest movie. And he was like a ses second assistant director on that movie. And uh, he, somehow the residuals he gets from like the DVD sales of Tombstone paid for this movie. Nice. <laughs> nice dad. <laughs> well, I mean, it was work he did. He was a second assistant director. Oh, Johan Johansson did the score for this. Who's that? The guy who died. 
that did the he did the great uh, score for uh, Sicario and oh okay uh, the Arrival and he oh. did Blade Runner and then they canceled it and went with the other guy oh yeah this was the last movie he did he died in Berlin I don't know if they know why because huh. he was only like forty eight. But, uh, okay, so that should be cool. Did it seem to have a standout soundtrack, or was it just kind of a techno kind of dun-dun-dun-dun soundtrack? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's all over the place. Because there's a point, like, the, the main bad guy, um, he has a band. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, like, weird 70s, like, like, like 70s computer through a pool, like, hearing it through a pool, like, that's... Okay. Because when you hear his band, they're in a drug like a, a like a, a shared drugs experience, and so you know things are extra weird. Okay. Um, yeah, I heard they're actually like taking acid in this movie. Like the characters are just on some kind of drugs all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like yeah, over the black rainbow is, or beyond the black rainbow, I should say. I'm getting it wrong. As a matter of fact, Beyond the Black Rainbow was pretty much a. It was set in the '80s, but it was pretty much. A, um, this one's set in the '80s too. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because I haven't seen this one yet, so I'm just going by Beyond the Black Rainbow. But Beyond the Black Rainbow has extended scenes of people that are on drug trips. Like it f- zooms in on their eyes and it shows their pupils getting huge. But that'll be on the screen for like five minutes. Which is this weird kind of '80s soundtrack in the background? So I don't know. I'll have to watch. There's, there's a chainsaw fight in this movie, so. Oh, okay. So <laughs> and Cheddar Goblin. Cheddar Goblin. That's the thing that I've heard about. Well, when it first comes on, like. It's. It seems like. Oh, was this actually a commercial in the '80s? And then at some point, oh no, this fucking wasn't a real commercial. Well, I've seen the commercial. I've oh, seen okay. Because I've seen he just like vomit. He just starts vomiting macaroni and cheese on the children. Because the guy said, uh, "What did they talk?" Because one of the podcasts I listened to, they actually know the guy who directed the commercial, and they said, "Yeah, he was like, I wanted it to be like the Tricks Rabbit, but he actually gets the milk." But he just goes crazy, and he's just full of it, and he has to get it out. <laughs> that was the cheddar goblin. Was like, oh, he gets all the fucking macaroni and cheese, and he's like, and he's sick, and he wants. Because I guess they film. It took eight hours to film that. <laughs> the kids that were in the thing were so excited; they thought it was hilarious because it was like, okay, we're gonna have the puppet throw vomit, fucking ch- macaroni and cheese all over you. And then everyone's going to take showers and we're going to do different shots. And the kids were like just up for it. The whole time. <laughs> I don't know if it took eight hours with filming, but it took eight hours to make it. And yeah, because the puppet guy and everyone, they, they just had this tube and a pump that would pump cheddar cheese out of the mouth of this thing. <laughs> so now I want to watch the movie. The cheddar Goblin. <laughs> There's already Cheddar Goblin t shirts. <laughs> Okay, chainsaw fight. That sounds pretty good. Let's see what else have I seen. Oh, Man in the High Castle season three. That started. I think I sent you a text about three weeks ago because they they launched a trailer a couple weeks before the season three started, and it, it reminded me of back then. I was like, oh, I see Man in the High Castle just becoming Wolfenstein. <laughs> that I'm going through the episode list of season three, and like the sixth episode is called The New Colossus. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> which, I mean, I know they destroy the Statue of Liberty at some point, which that was the, the term, The New Colossus, was actually a poem written about the Statue of Liberty in America. Huh. That's what that originally comes from, but it's like, no, this is a wink and a nod towards this is uh, fucking Wolfenstein. <laughs> but now. The series is a lot more. I, I know, like, season one was kind of an esoteric, sad, violent look at, like, what the world would be like if the Nazis and the Japanese occupied America. And the second season was more of the same. It had some dark moments, but it was pretty boring. Not the third season. They got a different guy running the show, and it's it's just been going into science fiction now. At the <laughs> Do they have giant mechanical hounds eating people? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> 
Well, well it's all multiverse. It's oh. Because okay. the Germans have this project. I forget it's a German word, and Himmler says it, but I, I can't remember what it is. But they know that there's these other universes. Because what they want is they want to come to the place. What did they say? Like, we know there's a place where America wants, because this is set in the 60s. And I don't, the multiverses don't jump time. It's all the same time, just different creations of the universe. And they, because they don't have hydrogen bombs yet in the Man in the High Castle. They just have atom bombs. And they say that we know that there is a world where they have a more powerful nuclear bomb. And then we know it's one of the worlds where America won, conquered the world. Or so that's how they perceive it because they have a bomb hundreds of times more powerful. And the Germans and the Japanese want the hydrogen bomb. So they're both playing around with these multiverse projects, um, but not successfully because it's basically people individually can jump between these multiverses, but they haven't figured out how they do it yet or what it is. So, cause, cause actually like the technology in the world of the man in the high castle is very far behind what sixties technology would be like in our timeline. So they have some things that seem more advanced, but really they're kind of in the, at right after the 1940s in some ways and then the germans are on the moon and shit but you know whatever that means but the whole world's dying and they know that so has, has it become fringe yet or are they going that way <laughs> they're going that way i think i'm only five episodes in um so i don't but i know that there's a project and they know about the multiverse they know who the mine but the man in the high castle well the germans know way more than the japanese uh, but the because the Japanese just tested their first atomic bomb at the beginning of season three. Oh, okay. And so, the, but they know because the Japanese know that the Reich can smash them at any time. They're just trying to figure out what can we do. You know, how can we? Because there's all these films, which was from the original Philip K. Dick book about these alternate universes, and everyone wants to know where they're coming from. The Germans know a lot more, but. Uh, but it's all the German Americans, which they're working. It seems like they're working against the German Reich, like because they have the American Nazi. Um, and it's weird because like uh, Herbert Hoover's in this, but he runs the American Gestapo, and uh, <laughs> but they call it something weird like the ARFB or something. And then uh, Lincoln Rockwell is the uh, Rice Marshal for America. And him and remember the John Smith guy, the the uh, guy who was in charge of the SS in America. Yeah. Well, that's working because Lincoln Rockwell was a real Nazi. He was a real person. He was assassinated in the '60s. But it's weird how they're bringing these other characters in, but they're real people, but they're playing very different roles. But the like the the because the American Nazis and the German Nazis are are working subtly against each other now. Because they have, they will, they the, the American Nazis. They think if they can get this multiverse technology, they can overthrow or do something to the Reich, <laughs> where it's the American Nazis that run things, not the German Nazis. Which is weird. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know what the. It's hard to tell with the Man in the High Castle because it takes these weird corkscrews sometimes. Where, oh no, it's not going this way. But this 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 ser- this season seems more exciting. <laughs> so far i mean for man in the high castle it's not non-stop action but still a lot of people looking bleakly at each other and talking <laughs> not 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 as much so spider-man you i know you wanted to tell me something about that oh yes yeah, so i've played the new spider-man game and, okay uh, <clears throat> only on playstation 4 so <laughs> um it was done by Insomniac Studios, which is usually, and this has been a real big hit for them, so that's nice because they seem to have like a lot of uh, stumbles the past couple of years. Um, but that's like one of the studios, like game studios. It's like notoriously like the worst places to work, but like you know, occasionally something good comes out of it. Like I finished that thing. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, and usually Insomniac is like listed as like one of the greatest places in the world to work. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so they put it out, but like, uh, what was interesting about it is like, it references everything like in this one game, like it kind of has its own twist on everything. Like it's, it kind of just like picks up where like, but like it didn't, it's not, it's not like a, 
it's not continuing any established fiction, but it, like it just feels like it picked up from something that you just haven't seen before. And oh. uh, but like it references the Tobey Maguire movies, even some of the Andrew Garfield movies, uh, the cartoons, um, the comic books. Um, and this one, he he's a scientist working for uh, Doc Ock. Like they're working on making the, you know, the limbs and stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was kind of like a, a re-contextualizing story for origin story for Doctor Octopus. Um, but yeah, it's just a really fun game. There's a lot of weird suits you can get where you can like look like the com- you can look like a comic book character, like in the real world. So, yeah. so from there, I went into like all this other stuff, and that's where I got into in you know there's the new movie coming out called into the spider verse which is also like a really large comic book series and i I read that one which that whole thing spans like four different comics but they just collected it all together um and that is uh it was also like eight different versions of the into the spider verse thing oh so there's the comic book version there is a there is a spider-man cartoon show on Disney XD, which I was thinking the other day, I was like, "Why doesn't like, hey, what happened up to like the Batman the animated series? I feel like kids don't have that now. It's all on Disney XD. Like, there's like a fucking Guardians of the Galaxy show and Avengers show. Like, they're just all in this no show. Idea. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't watch that show. It's a deep cable Disney. Well, I mean, like all those shows I mentioned before, they would be on. You know, they would be. Uh, syndicated to like uh fox like you know fox after school stuff oh okay so now disney just like they have their own channel so they just put all that shit there they're not syndicating it oh that makes sense <clears throat> um and then and then also like this into the spider-verse movie it is also a departure from the into the spider-verse comic book uh which is based is on the comic book there is a uh like some sort of weird immortal vampire family that is going through all the multiverses because they can get more power if they kill a Spider-Man. Okay. So and there's basically an infinite amount of Spider-Mans. <laughs> so it starts off with like some weird world where it's it's uh well it's got sort of like old England and Spider-Man's like a a uh, Shakespearean actor. Yeah, and then he he's immediately killed <laughs> in horrible fashion. Uh, there's an Indian Spider-Man where he's just like called Spider-Man India. There's also Spider-Man UK. Um, there's Nor Spider-Man. He's being voiced by Nick Cage in this movie coming up. Oh, all right. Who he just, uh, it's like a 1930s Spider-Man, but he basically looks like Batman and he has a gun. Oh, okay. Um, he has his own comic book. I'm not sure if his series is still going, but he had a run. I think it's a small run. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's Spider Pig. And then Spider there's... Pig, whose alternate name is Peter Porker, <laughs> who was a spider who got bit by a pig and became Spider Spider Ham. <laughs> I mean, there's Gwen Stacy Spider Man. She has her own series. It's currently still running. Is this? I thought it ended. Oh, I, is it ended now? I yeah, it's still running. Well, because I read all of them. Oh, okay. So I went to that. There's Spider Gwen. Yeah. Uh, which is like I like the way they design her because it has that vaporwave look like oh god they did you have to type in spider gwen but like she has a really cool look but uh i'm just looking at all the spider verse like there's a line chart here and it's like oh wow this is huge and confusing yeah Yeah, there's even i don't know if they're going to touch on it in there but there's even a spider verse where like Otto octavius still controls uh peter parker's brain yep that's uh and stuff so he's that's superior spider-man which I found yeah. it as an entertaining comic series as well because it's very kind of like just the Avengers don't seem to notice like for like a year he's not himself and he's like, why is he creating all these giant robots to control New York? Oh, whatever. <laughs> why is he way more violent than usual? <laughs> <laughs> like just basically like as soon as he gets the control back of his body, he's like, no one noticed. <laughs> like no one noticed all this shit that was going on. It's like, sorry, you just seem normal. This is like okay. Better like the the idea of Spider Gwen, because uh, uh, it's so Gwen Stacy is like a, the perpetual victim <laughs> uh, of like Spider Man stories. 
Like, she always has to die in horrible fashion. So it was, it was interesting. Like, she comes from a universe where she got bit by the spider, and then Peter Parker was just a nerd who got picked on at school, and then he, like, works on something, and he ends up becoming the lizard man, and then she, like, accidentally kills him somehow, and then she's wanted for his murder. <laughs> so oh. that, So now she's getting chased by the cops while trying to, like stop crime and stuff. I don't know. That's the other thing they don't really follow up well in the series. They don't give her like a big, other than the multiverse stuff. Like, yeah, she helps stop that. But like when she's in her own universe, she doesn't necessarily like stop the big bad thing that would make her like valuable to the city. <laughs> um, interesting. Like she, they, they, they pick her as or her universe is multiverse 65 which the way they draw it, it looks like G- GS for Gwen Stacy. <laughs> huh. It's a little art thing there. Yeah. Um, That's pretty cool. Uh, there's a there's a Spider Man with six arms, uh, because he tried to make a serum to stop it so he won't have spider powers anymore, and then he grew four additional arms. <laughs> yeah. Sound like that didn't work. Uh. Shit, what are the other spider? There's uh there's uh was it Lady Spider? She's the steampunk spider woman. Oh. There's also Spider Woman, which there's tons of those. Uh which I there's an interesting history to that. The reason they created Spider Woman in the first place uh was not out of like a great need. Uh it was basically for um uh just kind of like cold copyright things. Oh, okay. it's like way better to create Spider Woman before someone else does it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump on <laughs> um, so that stuff's kind of interesting. And then there's there's Spider Girl. There's Silk. Who I don't even know how to describe her. She basically she gets locked away in. She was apparently bit by the same spider that Peter Parker was, or like main. The main universe was it called Universe Six One Six? I don't remember. There's like I think that's supposed to be like the mainline universe because like the current Spider-Man is uh, Miles Morales. He is, oh. uh, and then so like the but there's like the Amazing Spider-Man books. They're more like following the continuing adventures of Peter Parker. It's more about Peter Parker. He's not really Spider. Well, he's still Spider-Man, but he's not really like the Spider-Man right now. Okay. Which that's what the end of the Spider-Verse stuff kind of gets into is is uh this peter parker is helping out miles morales like learn how to be spider-man oh all right um totally didn't know that i just thought there was a spider-man comic book and some movies yeah well there's like all dungeons and dragons it's it's like well and yeah well in the comic book like uh not all this stuff is well i mean i guess some of it's canon i mean this is almost like the uh what, what was that uh what was that thing that they did where they created the multiverse stuff? Was it in DC where they just like killed off everything because they had too many like alternating stories? I can't remember. Uh, it had a big yeah, name. Yeah, it was pretty much DC where they reset it because they just had two way alternate universes. It had a cool name. Universe. I can't remember it. I used to reference it a lot. Um, oh yeah, I remember you talking about Infinite that. Infinite Crisis. Yes. Yeah. Bat or yeah, Crisis of Infinite Earth. Is that what it's called? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like that. So. I mean, because the oh. new Fifty Two series is what started out the reboot of everything, and yeah, the universe again. Yeah, because that's what DC like they like just reboot everything like ten years every ten years or something yeah, like that. Yeah, pretty much. Marvel does kind of the same thing. Yeah, too. well, yeah, it's that like Civil War, and they had, even had Civil War Two. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen some of Civil War Two. That was pretty decent. I don't, I don't think I've read most of Civil War in the first one though. Yeah, yeah there's another Civil War. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. It's Marvel and DC always do the same fucking shit every ten or fifteen years, or not even that. It's they always recycle stuff. They always kind of come back. Because I was telling Colin, like the new Aquaman extended trailer borrows heavily from some of the new Aquaman stuff DC was doing before their new reboot that started or whatever with Rebirth, which was I don't get why they went from like we totally reset the universe to. Now we're just going to have, like, a Rick and Morty versus, like, what let's see what you got contest where they pull all the superheroes from all the different universes and have them battle royale each other to see who survives and who gets to be the one and only. 
and stuff like that. So it's like that's kind of like their new thing with Rebirth, but I think that's like a couple years old now. So maybe they're on to their new fucking thing after that. I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. At one point, they had DC Underworld, which I thought was really cool because it's like Satan makes a deal with all these villains and heroes on Earth to like give them superpowers or let them conquer their enemies in exchange for their souls. <laughs> so it's just basically like fucking every every superhero or villain that didn't make a pact with the devil battling the devils and the demons of the underworld <laughs> because like the joker and like lex luther and other people <laughs> sold their soul but then i can't there's some guy that's like a turncoat because he keeps going back and forth between hell and earth to try and give superman some information so it's just really really weird fucking battles like oh here's satan is this giant blonde guy with a green cape <laughs> <laughs> fucking battling superman it was interesting um yeah, then there was a another, so they had Spider Gwen, and then they had another like addition for her, and there's also Gwenpool. Yeah. Okay. Which isn't actually Stacy Gwen. Her name is actually Gwenpool. Mm. Um, but she has a lot of the, like she has blonde hair wow. and, with pink ends, which is kind of how I guess how they draw Gwen St- Stacy now. Have you seen Duckpool? No. <laughs> Power of the Duck is Deadpool. No, well that's what I, well that's where they premiered Gwynpool is in the Howard the Duck comics because you know apparently Howard the Duck's still going. Yeah, yeah whole thing. Um, and and that and Gwynpool is pretty funny, but it's it's very weird. Uh, it's uh, she basically comes from a world where there are no superheroes, but there are comic books, and so she reads a ton of comic books. And then at some point she gets sucked into a comic book world. And because she knows in a co- she's in a comic book, she has no superpowers. She just will just recklessly do things knowing that things are going to work out in her favor. <laughs> oh, okay. Like she, she hurries up and gets like a suit to be like a superhero. Because she knows like if I'm just a background character, I'm going to get killed immediately. <laughs> um. It, it was like pretty violent early on, but then they like they really tone it down, because like the way they draw Howard the Duck, she just looks like a grown ass woman, and then she like does things where like, uh, she like stole something, and then like, uh, it was like from some king. It was like Black Cat is like a kingpin or something like that, and so she has to get it back, but then she kind of like cuts that off. It, she goes to a park and. And she's like interviewing this cop. And he's like, "Are you this cop who's like an undercover agent for a black cat?" And he's like, "What?" And she just pulls a gun out of a bag and shoots the cop in the middle of the park. <laughs> so she is basically like a video game for her. It's like, ah, oh, there's no consequences, fuck it. <laughs> but then they give her like a conscious, like like three volumes in, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Um, yeah, it's a pretty funny comic book. Um. I wouldn't necessarily like recommend go out and read it, but it was it was I laughed out loud at a bunch of stuff. Have you read the Deadpool like Night of the Living Dead series? No, because he does. I haven't gotten the third one because I don't know if it exists yet. Maybe it's not out yet. But he does Night of the Living Dead, and then the is it Dawn of the Living or Dawn of the Dead is the next one? Or yeah, because he does the Night of the Living Dead, and then Dawn of the Dead, and it kind of loosely follows some of the plot, but it's mostly him trying to get a good chimichanga <laughs> by also like fighting off the zombie apocalypse and like not really rescuing survivors because he like <laughs> gets in there and like oh i saved you and then they're all dead and he's like well i tried <laughs> <laughs> and it's just eventually he gets bitten and turns into a zombie and then he spreads the zombie plague and wipes out the earth or whatever but then he comes back and is like oh i guess i regenerated from this too and then he figures out he bites the zombies back, they heal the heal the zombies. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like weird fucking shit, and it's fucking a really cool comic book. Huh. Yeah, so I picked up. All right, I probably got to cancel it, but I picked up Comicsology, which is basically just an app that Amazon has. I think it's like five dollars a month, and you can get a ton of comic books for free. Hmm. It's like new ones you still got to pay for, but. Anything that's like three years old or older was like it's pretty much just available <laughs> to read, huh? Because I started up The Boys, which that's a Garth Ennis comic book. The guy who did the pre the preacher, yep. And uh, it's about like 
it's like a CIA contingent that keeps superheroes in order. So if they get out of line, they'll just like put a hit on a superhero. <laughs> so it's just like dudes. It's like nobody with superpowers, but they'll beat the shit out of people. I haven't gotten that far yet. I hear they do like terrible things to kill people. So, huh? Because they just turned it into a an FX show, I think, or is it AMC? I can't remember. Because I know AMC does Preachers, I'm thinking like that. Maybe AMC, because they might have the rights to it, because they have the universe rights to Robert Kirkman's properties. I know that's not one of them, but... Yeah. What's the superhero one that he did? Invincible, that's okay. in the movie. Huh. I hear that's good, I just... Uh... Yeah, I've never checked it out either. <laughs> All I saw was people talking about the rape scene in that movie, which is her in the comic book, that's... Uh, but they the had him on uh, a, a comedy bang bang one time, and he's he was uh, talking about because what they did that for like nine years or something. Pretty yeah, he time. did it for a long time. I, I mean, about as long as he did with The Walking Dead. I mean, The Walking Dead's still going. I, I don't know if he's still involved in it. I think he is, because I just got. I mean, I ordered Walking Dead and the new Saga trade yesterday. That should be. So that I don't know. It, I can't remember if his, what his involvement is anymore with the actual series. I know, obviously, TV-wise, he's not doing anything anymore. Oh, is he just completely off? He's just a producer now? Because I know he was writing for, like, a little bit. and like. I think he might be totally off it now. Yeah. I mean, because he's had other stuff, because Amazon always, like, since I bought all my Walking Dead comics and some other Robert Kirkman stuff through him, because I think I got, like, this fucking werewolf comic book that he did for a little bit that was kind of weird. The fucking, like, like, oh, Robert Kirkman's doing this now. And it's like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, I have no idea what the fuck he's doing. Uh, oh, I finally watched the last season of Man on, or Last Man on Earth. Oh, really? Uh, which, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Because that's, like, two. How did it end? Huh? How did it end? Did everyone die? No. no. <laughs> oh. In fact, they found hundreds of people alive. <laughs> Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> but it's almost a situation where they're almost like cornered, maybe. That you not really, you can't really tell. Plus, yeah. it's like brother comes back again, yeah, and stuff, which I was really happy about. And I was like, oh, this show's canceled now. What the fuck? Well, yeah. that it's like, well, it's it's, it's two sh- like The Walking Dead, and then also Last Man on Earth. They're like two fictions you never see like completed to the end. Because oh, okay. that's kind of like the interesting thing about like The Walking Dead. Uh, and what I think what Robert Kirkman wanted to do in the first place is like let's take a zombie movie and just extend it as far as possible and see where it goes. Yeah. Because I mean that there's only like, there's only two ways that can end. Like either they figure the shit out and are able to live with this, or they just solve it, or the entire world dies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's got any other zombie movie, it just either ends with everybody dying or somebody rides off into the sunset and, you know, no, nobody knows what happens to Well, it's it. like everybody it's dies that you know. You never see, yeah. like, the entire world perish. And, like, what does that mean? That'd be horrifying. <laughs> just like, that's it. Humanity's done. <laughs> oh, we got World War Z. <laughs> like, which um, is still, that, isn't that follow-up movie still being made? Yeah, yeah, Brad Pitt. I mean, because that first one made money despite having so many troubles, but... I mean, I think the second one had fucking, uh, uh, Dave, what the fuck's his name? The, the fucking Fight Club guy, David Fincher. Oh. He, he was, like, attached for, like, a hot minute, and then now it's in limbo again. I'm still waiting for that Black Hole remake. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reboot, nah, the Disney opted out. They read the script, and they're like, what are you, a serial killer? Because <laughs> it's even weirder than the one from the late 70s well, i know they're redoing dark crystal yeah eh, why not? Yeah. That's I, I mean i don't know if they'll how that'll fucking go over because i'm assuming since they own jim henson's or like Do the they? Muppets i guess shit, like i i know that because i only saw happy time murders like jim henson puppeteers did that movie yeah it is like nobody advertised that at all. I think that would have got the movie a lot more. Well, a lot more. because I do a lot of kids things, I don't think they put that far front facing. I know, but that's the thing. It's marketed towards people that are like us. We grew up with Jim Henson and the Muppets. Yeah. And we have a... a well, no, the trailer is like from the guy who directed the Muppet movie and stuff like that. So that's where they... That's not the same as jim henson puppeteers and jim henson's workshop doing that yeah movie. well yeah i remember like back when farscape they made that a big thing like this is jim henson doing this <laughs> or his company <laughs> yeah 
But I have no. I, I know Disney owns the rights to the Muppets, but they, do they control Jim Henson Studios? Yeah, I'm not sure about that because they still do Sesame Street and things like that. So yeah. they might like have a a survivable income to be an independent company. But I just I don't actually know. Because I mean, yeah. it's kind of. It's, I realize they don't want to like throw like. There's a lot of bad shit in that movie, so it's not, it's not like I'm saying like, every kid should be associated with that or whatever. But at the same time, it's. I don't know. It's a good movie, and I think it deserves. Isn't there more. some? Isn't there some kind of like, like a Broadway play, like, like something from A Block or whatever, like that? That's kind of like a an adult Sesame Street with. I can't remember what it is. I know they made something like that. Maybe I just don't. Remember. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. Oh well. I don't remember that one. I'm not a big play aficionado, so. Well, yeah, I remember there's like advertised on Comedy Bang Bang. Like uh, for like a year. Or like something. I didn't know until I watched the Michael Moore interview today from Peter Travelers. I didn't know that he had a fucking Broadway play. Oh sure, everyone. <laughs> well, everybody that wasn't me because I don't give two shits about theater. <laughs> well, there's yeah, different kinds of theaters. It's very showy theater that's like big production, and then there's stuff where it's like two guys talking with chairs. <laughs> like that's both Broadway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can go different directions. I mean, like, essentially, Reservoir Dogs is a Broadway play. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it. That describes why I always fall asleep watching it. <laughs> a lot of talking. Oh, did you see the mashup of Pulp Fiction and Brett Kavanaugh's testimony? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Look at the big brains on Brett. <laughs> <laughs> And then they cut to some other senators like, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. Yeah, like Lindsey Graham saying how, what a fucking travesty it was and shit. And he's like, you fucking ask your damn thing. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? And you watched the Last Week Tonight episode with the Kavanaugh trial, right? Or the no, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen a Last Week Tonight for like the past six months okay the way he breaks it down because i've had to endure a lot of shit at work from people being like oh how could they do that to that poor man (laughs) or whatever and i'm like um one you have to hear both sides of the story to conduct an investigation and two how the fuck do you know he's not lying as much as you think she's lying because he has this calendar he brings out with like all this shit on it and it actually points out parties he went to that he claims he never went to and then he was like, oh, it's a tradition in my family. My father would always gather us around the Christmas tree or the holidays around the fireplace and recite from the, his calendar. And he starts crying and getting worked up about it. And then John Oliver's like, yeah, I kind of felt bad, you know, drawing up a bit for this and making fun of him with his deceased dad and his calendars. But his father's right fucking there <laughs> sitting behind him. And then he was like, the other thing is, he said he started the calendars in 1978. Which means in 1979, he would have one calendar to show his family. And by that time, Brett Kavanaugh was 14 years old. <laughs> so Fuck te- you, Dad. <laughs> so you're telling me a 14-year-old teenage boy just willingly sat with glee in his eyes waiting for his father to recite the events from his one-year-old calendar in 1979. And it's just like a bunch of fucking bullshit. And it's just how, like, Brett Kavanaugh kept, like, attacking people the whole fucking time and yelling and being a little bitch. <laughs> and it's just like, uh... He just got nominated, didn't he? He's now, yeah, he he's was, now on he's the Supreme like, Court. Oh, fucking really? Yeah. Well, no, I guess... Uh, no one was gonna... It was 48 to 50. There wasn't enough people to stand Well, I guess it. the Philadelphia Flyers' new mascot will now be on their, their dog Supreme Court then. <laughs> Why, what's the connection there? Because they said since he's such a loose cannon, nobody should forget how he got onto the Supreme Court and basically being a travesty and him being such a piece of shit that oh. there's this new mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers look like Grimace and a fry monster fucked each other. <laughs> and basically, like, it looks horrific, like a horrible, like, orange, bright orange Sasquatch. For the most part, it's like a it's like a, an abyss of a mouth, some googly eyes, and no nose, and bright orange fur. <laughs> but supposedly, like the, the first game, like the guy or woman or whoever in the mascot uniform fell down, fell down several times against the Pittsburgh Penguins, 
And so the Penguin got on his, his Twitter account and said, well, I guess he can't skate, LOL. And then the guy, the Philadelphia Flyers mascot got on is like, you better watch, you better watch it, you better not sleep or whatever. <laughs> Basically tell him he's going to fucking kill him and shit. It's like, what the fuck is this crap? <laughs> like, it's just... And apparently has like a Kim Kardashian photo and shit already, and a bunch of other crap, which makes no sense. And yeah. <laughs> they're really trying for a new audience <laughs> hockey, aren't they? <laughs> ah, we can't pick up any more from Canada. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have to make this a fucking reality show for the Americans. Yeah, mascots <laughs> killing each other and showing their big asses. And... <sighs> but no, I would like to talk about something before I leave because it's just something I thought was funny. Has anyone seen the Ocean's 8 movie? No. No, what is that one? Is that it's like they're the, trying to rob a bank? It's the female Sandra Bullock it's the one. female version of Ocean's oh. 11 or 7 or whatever. It's, it's the Ghostbusters version. Ghostbusters. Okay. The latest Ghostbusters version of Ocean's This is basically the version of Ghostbusters where they didn't pretend there was no other Ghostbusters before them, where they acknowledge it, but they acknowledge it every five minutes of the movie to let you not forget that there's been other people who have done this before. <laughs> Because the whole part of marketing of this movie and why everybody that gave it a bad review got so much shit because they were like, oh, you know, this is all women and that's why... You must giving, hate women. This is why you're Can't giving it... Can't also be a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're giving it a bad review and, you know, we're just trying to stand on our own and make a great movie for women. And it's just like... Every... About being thieves? Yes. Yeah, about... <laughs> Role about... models for girls. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's not... None of the actresses are bad. There's not a bad actress in that movie. They all do a good job with their roles. As bland and as archetype as they might be for the exact same roles from the original movies. But every fucking five minutes, I shit you not, in that movie, there is a mention of George Clooney or somebody asking about George Clooney. (laughs) A picture of George Clooney in the background for some fucking reason. I don't know why. And then also the Chinese acrobat makes an appearance in the movie after Sandra Bullock's character says that she wants no men involved at all. It just is going to spell trouble and disaster. That was just the stupidest idea ever for men to be involved in a heist. And it's just like she fucking... uh, So so George Clooney is the poochie of Ocean's 8? (laughs) Basically. It's just like even the the Jewish guy that owned the casino in like the first couple ones. Yeah. He makes an appearance in the first five minutes after she gets out of jail to say how sorry he is and how Danny wouldn't want her to do this life or whatever. <laughs> and it's just like, as much as they wanted it to be a standalone, like women are empowered, women can steal and be brilliant or whatever. <laughs> every five minutes is propped up by, I know George Clooney. <laughs> it's just like, my brother was a famous thief and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it's yeah, all... Yeah, it seems like a weird... It seems like something a producer would make. <laughs> it's, yeah. We have to remind everybody that this cool mo- this is cooler than the other movie, or just as cool. But then it's like, it goes to... It's like one of those alternate universes where like all... It takes place at the Met Gala and stuff, so it's like this party and end all parties bullshit. And it's like... Uh, Anna Kendrick is not a celebrity or whatever because she's not Anna Kendrick. Uh, Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Sorry, I always get those two confused for some reason. I have no idea why. <laughs> Probably because they're very similar in look and they're play the same age demographic. But um, anyway, so she's a celebrity by a different name, and so she's supposed to be the one that they plant, you know, the fake jeweler on and steal all the diamonds and shit, and that's the gist of the movie. But then it goes to, like, other celebrities, and it's like, well, apparently Kim Kardashian's still a celebrity in this universe, <laughs> and so is Jay-Z, but apparently all these famous actors and actresses that are in this movie are now just regular Joe Schmoes <laughs> and steal and do stupid shit for people. Like, James Corden's in that movie is a horrible fucking insurance fraud investigator. They're not horrible as in a despicable character, just horrible as in bad acting. But um, as a TV show host, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's been in other stuff though. There was this one with uh, uh, the guy that was in Warm Bodies and like Jack the Giant Slayer, where he's like yeah. a record executive and it's like psycho almost, but it's in Britain. <laughs> and James Corden's in that movie. But he's actually kind of he's like a just completely like, high drunk fuck up that he murders to like take the credit and like start running the record company and <laughs> shit. So, like, he's decent in that movie, but I think it's only because he gets killed and he just acts like a <laughs> fucking idiot for, for the 10 or 20 minutes he's in the movie. 
Yeah, you just did it method. <laughs> but no, that Ocean's 8 was, I mean, it had even the Ocean's twist at the end where it's like, we told you this happened, but really this happened. And it's like, it couldn't just be just a one and done heist movie. And it couldn't be anything interesting because it was still for revenge against the man after all too. And it's like... Well, I hope Ocean's 9 is just as weird as Ocean's 12. <laughs> Have you ever seen Ocean's 12? No. It's fucking weird. It's like the it was it's like the last Jedi of the Ocean's movies <laughs> where it's just like constantly uh trying to defeat your expectations. Oh, okay. So it, you're rocking a ship while being chased by another ship? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You have a uh, See, uh, you have Julia Roberts. Uh, uh, one of the the uh, things, the tricks they make in the movie is that she pretends to be Julia Roberts. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, have you or either you see the trailer for Vice or Mule yet? No. I think I've seen the trailer for Mule. That's the one with Clint Eastwood, right? Yeah, it's his new movie where he's like a 90, basically looks like a 90 year old drug smuggler <laughs> and shit like that. That looks really interesting because like Bradley Cooper and Michael Pena and Lawrence Fishburne, I swear one other person that's recognizable in it. Huh. And then uh, if you watch Vice, Colin, I want you to tell me. Who you think's playing Dick Cheney without looking at the cast? Oh yeah, yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, fucking like uh, Christian Bale is fucking Dick Cheney. It is like holy oh. fucking shit. <laughs> like that's really good. Yeah, movie. he ate a lot of hamburgers. He just got really fat for that role. <laughs> <laughs> but like fucking uh, Sam Rockwell looks really fucking good as George Bush. Yeah, yeah. And then Amy Adams looks solid for the few part times you yeah, see her. Steve Carell playing Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I think that'll be interesting because he's a good actor. He's a versatile actor too. So yeah, Adam cool. Adam McKay's writing director. He did the big short, but he's also like an upright citizens brigade guy. And oh, yeah, he did didn't he do uh, uh, Anchorman? Or he's a writer on that. He's, he's he got he was started off as a comedian. Now he's kind of like this political comedy serious movie guy. <laughs> <clears throat> won an I think he won an Oscar for the big short. But just like oh. watching that and then seeing today like new stills from the Rambo 5 movie they just started production. <laughs> where Rambo's a cowboy. Okay. All right. Apparently it takes off. What's right, the location? Well, it takes off right after the end of Rambo 4 where it supposedly goes back to his dad's ranch in Arizona. Huh. And the whole movie is supposed to be that he it starts off in Arizona. He's working the ranch. And then he goes to rescue some friend's family that's kidnapped by the Mexican drug cartel. Oh, okay. Or whatever, so it's like it sounds promising, but they, they said like Stallone didn't want to do this movie. He thought Rambo was definitely done, and there's nothing else he could add to it. He was fascinated by doing a prequel of Rambo, where he would direct the movie, and then he would direct somebody else as the young Rambo in Vietnam. But apparently, he went the other way with it. And now he's just doing. Well, they're gonna do that anyways. In a way, they're. <laughs> Have you heard of the Die Hard prequel movie? Just called McLean. Really? No. Yeah. Yep. Which huh. I don't I I don't know how that will work, but yeah, it's supposed to be kind of like a flashback movie, so you'll have Bruce Willis like in the future and then you'll flash back to like him like becoming a cop or something. I don't know. The, 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 that will never work because it's like what what thing happened to his past that was not bigger than all the other shit that you've seen. Yeah, he never alludes to anything in the movie is where it's like God, this isn't like my teenage years, thank God, or something. He's not. A uh, thing that happened at the police academy where, the, where they took over the place with tanks. And I alluded Here them. Before. Yeah. Do you see the Rocket Man trailer? Which one's that? Elton John movie. Oh, no. Playing I haven't Elton seen. John. No, I haven't seen that. That looks fucking pretty. Just from the visuals, it's almost like a psychedelic musical slash biography of Elton John's life. Huh. So it's like Taron Edgerton, I think, is a pretty solid pick because he's a good fucking actor. I kind of really want to see him in that Robin Hood movie that comes out soon. Because <laughs> that looks like really ridiculous and kind of like maybe what the Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie should have been. Yeah, yeah, that movie looks like, this will probably suck, but I'm hopeful it won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, there's a lot of good movies that looks like you're coming out. Like, they've released more stuff about Hellboy. 
Like yeah. some of them said April. Is that coming out this year? Yeah. I thought, no, okay. It's, I thought it's either April or January because I saw two different sources. One said January, one said April. Because I know like they got rid of the first director. Uh, so I know that's been kind of in limbo. Well, the guys doing it now did the descent and did like the Battle of Bastards episode for Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. And another horror movie that everybody loved and has a cult following, but I can't remember the name of it right now. I want to say it was like Splinter or something like that, but he's done two cult classic horror movies that everybody likes. He's directed multiple TV episodes of Game of Thrones that were critically, critically acclaimed, and also a bunch of other TV episodes for different shows that are critically acclaimed. So he's got a good pedigree. I don't really like Mila Jovovich as the villain. Okay. Because apparently it's going to be heavily based around magic this time, not physical action. And then it's, uh, what's his name? Ian Clark? Or fuck. The guy who was in Game of Thrones last season is like this kind of like mentor to the Hound, and then he gets killed. Oh, good night. Dad says good night. Oh. Night. Isaac Clark, maybe? Night. I can't remember his name. He's like Irish, and he's kind of like dark skinned and dark hair. An older gentleman. Yeah, is that the. Is, like is, is that the guy when he was like trying to like not be violent? And yeah, he's, he's the trying guy. not to be violent. And okay, yeah. Yeah, he's going to play the doctor that raises Hellboy and stuff like that. All right. And so it's like, it seems solid. And the guy that wrote the Cowboy comics actually did the screenplay. Okay, cool. So it seems like it'll be on good footing. And then same, because that's what's happening with Spawn, is that Todd McFarlane's running that whole thing. Oh, that does, I know that seems good, but that's not good. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> well, you, we'll see. You need to get like uh Alex Proyas out of retirement, like he should do some spawn shit. <laughs> um, I, I, this is on a podcast. Um, because I think the last movie that Alex Proyas did was that uh, Gods of Egypt movie. God, that was oh. bad. Okay. Yeah, which I hear was terrible. But like, one of the things I hear is that uh, like he got a lot of shit for like you know because it was like whitewashing, like all these white yeah, John act- Butler is an Egyptian god. And uh, so Alex Proyas, he's actually like, of Egyptian heritage, and he actually like put a lot of effort into like getting things right for this movie. Like they they went to Egypt and did all this research, and I think actually shot things there. And then maybe it just hammered on him like, "You fucking racist piece of shit." Well, you know when you get fucking the guy who plays Jamie Lannister to be your protagonist, you get Gerard Butler to play the God of War. Yeah. And fucking, like, nobody in that movie is, is basically looks even halfway Arabic or Egyptian. Yeah. It seems kind of stupid. But I mean, you some, you, sometimes you get a movie made, you gotta, you oh, gotta get certain people. But I'm yeah. sure the studio wanted certain actors in it to make it more marketable or, you know, whatever. But it's, that movie was, I thought at least it'd be a spectacle as far as, like, oh, yeah, well, you'll never see this in another movie. And it wasn't even that. It was yeah. just... Yeah, it was bad. I haven't. I've seen some stuff of it, and yeah, I was like, ah, oh, man, this guy can, this guy can do better things. But oh well. <laughs> well, you want to talk about Star Trek? Oh shit! I can believe I have to look up all that stuff. But yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, well, yeah, I, to, I mean, there's nothing. I just gotta go. But. Yeah, I gotta go because I gotta go to a breast cancer walk tomorrow. So. <laughs> all right, well, have fun with that. Yeah. See you next week. Yep. Yeah, or. Well, two weeks from now. Yeah. Two weeks from now? Yeah. Was there any horror movie you want to put in advance? To, or no, I to mean, see? you guys can just choose, because i gotta, I got to probably figure out Filmstruck anyway. So, okay. Because i got to work overtime next Saturday again, probably, so I might as well take another week no. off like usual. Well, thanks for doing the show. We'll see you. No ya. problem. Thanks for having me. No. Sorry I had to leave early. That's all right. Well, that's fine. Oh. We'll carry the torch. <laughs> yeah. Or we'll go into the world of Nathan's world of excitement. <laughs> now, anyway, uh, as we as I planned to do three weeks ago before my son broke his arm and overtime, and uh, then you had, uh, what was your? Just homework. Uh, yeah, some kind of learning to program something, Java or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see. I, um, I got it drawn into a weird uh, Star Trek universe that i remembered because i had a lot of these games it was the the fasa star trek the role-playing game which existed from 1982 to 1989 
and uh, and I had a lot of these books because um, a lot of things you can find on the internet now are the um, oh what was it the uh, like the starship shipyards websites where they have all these kind of blueprinted looking star trek ships it's like oh i've never seen these i've never heard of these yeah most of those come from fast of star trek huh. um which is a very it's actually called the fast of star trek universe now it, ha- it has an online fan base huh. um and the thing is is uh from from 82 to 89 paramount licensed fasa to make this star trek the role-playing game which also had a element of tabletop gaming to it, kind of the hexagrid gaming, yeah, yeah, of, of moving starships around and stuff. And uh, and I had a lot of this stuff. Um, I mainly like to read the role playing books just because they had like you know, I mean the, some of the stuff was very elaborate and involved. It had like its own characters, it's kind of its own story, its own ships, and then they had blueprints of the ships. Some of the books had actual blueprints tucked in the back that you pulled out and unfolded and looked at huh. and it was uh um it ended kind of controversial because in in 89 when star trek the next generation finally started to look like it had legs under it all of a sudden paramount pulled all the licensing huh. that we don't want fasa to make any more uh star trek role-playing stuff but th- there's another star trek role-playing game it's called uh, it's called the starfleet universe that still exists and that's basically like plotting out against starship battles and, and things like that, but it has a role playing element to it, kind of a mild one. Yeah. Whereas the FASA universe had it was like Dungeons and Dragons with Star Trek. Um but um I remember when I was reading this stuff in the eighties and I some of these books I had, some of them I didn't, because some of them were horribly expensive. <laughs> uh even by eight standards, like you could get a reference book, it was about this thick. And it had some blueprints, and it was forty five dollars in nineteen eighty six. Like that's a lot of fucking <laughs> money. Um, so some of those books were really. I don't. I didn't have all the Star Trek FASA books, but I had about seventy percent of them, and I still have a few of them lying around. Um, but I, I never realized the whole backstory behind it. I thought it just oh, this kind of died off in the early nineties because computers took over, and it's it's like nope they. Uh, they pulled the they pulled the licensing from it, and it was interesting the reasons why. I mean, there's different versions of this story, but um, in FASA Star Trek, you have the Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans, and imagine those um, like amorphous 3D zones of space they control, where they butt together. There's this kind of area in the middle they called the Triangle. Now, this is only in the FASA Star Trek universe. This doesn't exist in canon Star Trek or the TV series or the movies or anything. But that's like a zone of lawless murder. (laughs) And it's where most of the adventures in FASA Star Trek are set. Because if you just want to operate as a Starfleet captain in the Federation-controlled territory, well, you're not going to do a lot of stuff. (laughs) You're not going to do a lot of conflicts. (laughs) Well, you're not going to be able to explore the darker aspects of your personality uh, operating in Federation Klingon or Romulan space. And it's also weird because the Klingons are interpreted very differently in FASA Star Trek because I actually have the Klingon source book. I read through it again. And the Klingons in FASA Star Trek, because the first time you see the full Ridgehead Klingons as we know them now, and, and I'm not talking about uh, Discovery. That's its own whatever. But, or the Abrams verse, but I mean, I'm talking mainly the the next generation and the uh, the. Well, they mean the movies, movies, right? Yeah. It was, well, the first time you saw the Ridgehead Klingons was Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Yeah. And uh, and that was always assumed to be well, they didn't have special effects for the TV series that could do that, so they did that. Well, in the FASA universe, because the, their main points of reference for FASA Star Trek are the original series and the first four. Uh, theater movies so we have uh, motion picture wrath of khan uh search for spock and then the voyage home those are the those are all the materials they integrate interrogate for that and so the the fasa universe klingons is like no there's three different kinds of klingons there's the ridge klingons those are called imperial klingons and then there's the smooth forehead ones like from the original series those were klingon human hybrids that the Klingons made to infiltrate human space. 
and then there's Klingon Romulan hybrids, <laughs> but they're treated as like a lower cast of Klingons because they're based on a book uh, written by John Ford about the Klingons called The Final Reflection. It, it's kind of like original series uh, fiction. Um, and I forget when that came out, but it was written by a guy named John Ford. And the Klingons there are, they're a lot more like the Cardassians on Deep Space Nine than the honor driven Klingons of, of like uh, the next generation, like the Worf characters and all that. Yeah. They're, here there there is the honor world and there is all that but there it's used much more opportunistically <laughs> the klingon empire is actually an empire with an emperor and it's run like a totalitarian police state like there's so it's very very just imagine the klingons as cardassians <laughs> that's what they are in the fasi universe now the romulans interestingly are seen as uh, you know, kind of definitely genocidal people that want to conquer the federation and destroy the romulans but more honorable and kind of less cunning maybe than the Klingons because they're the only thing the FASA universe has to base the Romulans on is the, uh, the balance of terror. And then they also had them in the enterprise incident too. But so they were seen as like, uh, cause remember in the balance of terror, like Kirk and the Klingon commander talk one la or the Romulan commander talk one last time. And he's like, we can beam you aboard. You don't have to die. And he's like, no, it's our way. You beat me. And then he detonates the engine. So, so the Romulans, which I don't have that book, but I read it online. Um, so it, it's interesting. Like the everything's just interpreted differently in in the FASA Star Trek, and uh, and the Klingons are evil, but kind of opportunistic. Humans are the well, the Federation actually is is way more complicated in the FASA universe than even in the movies because you have different groups that are playing against each other, and the because the Federation is way outsized in power compared to the Romulans or the Klingons. Federation just a lot bigger and has a lot more. They're a lot. It's weird because there's no money because it's like a utopian society. But for some reason, the Federation has a much larger economy than either the Romulans or the Klingons. <laughs> so that so the Romulans and the Klingons are always doing things to subvert the Federation in the triangle, <laughs> which is where everything happens, because there you can act like a pirate. Whereas in, in controlled space, you can't. So, um, but they had some real interesting, um, what was I going to talk about? Oh, let's talk about how it ended first. Uh, so I've ex sort of explained roughly my view of how the FASI universe comes together based on what I've read. And apparently Paramount wanted to take a second look at a lot of the material that was being published. Because when The Next Generation came out, there were a lot of people, they got letters, and this was back when people actually wrote letters, they got letters from fans like, well, you're changing the Star Trek universe. It's, it's like, why do they have all these ships? What happened to this ship and this ship and this ship? Because this stuff was licensed by Paramount. It had the Paramount name on it. They saw the fastest stuff, the fans, a lot of them, who just bought the books to read them and didn't play the role-playing game. They saw this as canon, and they're like, well, the next generation just changing everything around. Like, this didn't happen. Like, where's the second Romulan War? Where is this? <laughs> where is that? And the Paramount people are like, what, what, are the, what are these people writing to us about? And so then um, in 1989, when, like I said, the next generation looked like it was finally getting legs under it and wasn't going to be a complete bomb, Gene Roddenberry was sort of in ascendancy again uh, for running the Star Trek universe. And he took one look at this fastest stuff and he was like, oh, this is just violence and killing in this <laughs> universe. This isn't what we want to do. And there were two, because they would always send them things to Paramount about this is what's coming out next month. And there were two things that uh, kind of killed it for FASA. There was one, it was called the Four Years War, Return to Axanar. And then there was another one called Operation Armageddon, which was set in the world where the where the Federation just tries to conquer the Klingons and the Romulans at the same time because they're tired of the constant threat. And, of course, they're running out of the lithium crystals. And so what these books never got published. By, well, no, the uh, Return to Axanar did, but uh, the other one didn't get pre -pub uh, published because it's like, well, this is totally not what Star Trek is about and. So uh, they pulled the licensing out from under them very quickly. And so all, but all this stuff that was all these supplements and these, uh, 
like they had federation intelligence that was always doing you could play like in a federation cia agent where you just go around and kill people and sabotage klingon shipyards it's all kinds of cool stuff but none of it was actually like um uh what would you consider the main star trek universe yeah because they started publishing stuff for the next generation too where they sort of backpedaled on some of the uh, like ship designs and stuff, and the, and the, but the ships were so powerful in the fastest Star Trek universe, and they were so numerous, like they just had these giant, like the Federation built dreadnought after dreadnought after <laughs> dreadnought, just these insanely four engine ships with, uh, which is weird. I never got why they put the extra engine or nacelles on the outside of the ship, because those are just warp field projectors. They don't produce more power. That's in the middle of the ship, but whatever. It looks cool. And, um, <laughs> I, need a, I need a couple more warp nacelles in case the other ones get damaged. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess. It's redundancy. <laughs> uh, well, you know why the Star Trek ships look that way, right? With the saucer and all the exposed architecture and stuff? Not really why. Uh, because originally, as conceived, that saucer was always supposed to detach from the main ship, and that's how they would get down to the planet. Oh, okay. And when they went to Param or the studio, and they said, "Yeah, we want to do this every episode," there's like, "You can't afford that. We can't make a model that comes apart and film a kind of sequence all the time." Okay, now we have transport. So, <laughs> well, the cool design, so we'll just stick with that because you know Roddenberry was an aeronautical engineer and a pilot. So he he designed that stuff to have those swooping gull like protrusions and stuff. That's why everyone else has something that's like the Klingons. That looks like a warship. Everything's compact. Things that are away from the main part. Everything of the ship. is leading to the part that destroys everything. <laughs> yes, yes, it's like those are battleships. The Federation stuff just looks like a bunch of fragile shit that's going to be shot off. But um, yeah. So that's uh, that's a uh, FASA Star Trek, and uh, um, so I, I just I. I found out like a lot of the stuff because it's kind of had a resurgence online just because people think the ships look cool. And in, in Starship, like in, in like building models, which is my thing now, uh, there's a lot of people like I want to build the fastest Star Trek, like the Baker Destroyer, which is just a saucer section with a big bulky body and two stubby nacelles that come off the bottom. It looks like a bulldog if a starship was a bulldog, and it's kind of a cool-looking ship. And, yeah, there's people out there that'll make a garage kit for you to do it. And so, uh, yeah, there's there's enough interest out there still in the fastest Star Trek universe that people are, like, trying to recreate, you know, things that they did in the 80s. But I never understood... Um, where all this stuff went or why it died off when I was a kid reading it. Cause it's like in 1990, it just ended. Like you couldn't find this stuff anywhere. And then, you know, I just sort of forgot about it and <laughs> looked into it uh, later. It's like, Oh, I didn't know there was this whole, whole thing out here of, uh, you know, Star Trek, the role-playing game by FASA. And, and, uh, and it was based, based on a book, kind of Star Trek fiction, an official Star Trek fiction book. But, uh, that's what the Klingons were based on. And so, yeah. I didn't realize how the Klingons evolved so much and changed, uh, even throughout the course of the movies. Um, and how much the next generation uh, added so much more to the Klingon lore that uh, they, they were. Because even the Klingons in, uh, uh, what was it, uh, The Search for Spock, th those were these kind of Klingons. Like, this story, what they were doing... The John, what they call the John Ford Klingons, that's still who they were. Huh. It wasn't until the next generation, and then, you know, you had the undiscovered country, but that was several years into the next generation where it's like, oh, no, it's these kind of Klingons. Because I didn't, like in Star Trek Three, that was supposed to be a Romulan ship. It was supposed to be the Romulans that were trying to steal the Genesis device. And a lot of the role-playing material lists that ship as a Romulan bird of prey. And when, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because they have like the the two birds of prey. There's a Romulan bird of prey and a Klingon bird of prey. Well, see, a lot of that got cross checkered because they used the Romulan ships and the Klingon ships were interchangeable in the Enterprise incident because it's like, oh well, we bought these ships from the Klingons, but they have cloaking devices. See, the Romulans were, or the Klingons were supposedly never smart enough to invent cloaking devices. Only the Romulans use that. Yeah. But come Star Trek 3, when Leonard Nimoy takes over, he's like, 
I don't want to do Romulan bad guys. Klingons are way more compelling. So there was a side story that was scripted but never shot where Krug and those Klingons stole that ship from the Romulans because it had a cloaking device, and th- then they, but they never filmed it. So then it just became a Klingon bird of prey with a cloaking device. So that's like, it's weird because it's all this stuff is so important to some people, and you find out, oh, it's just a couple <laughs> guys spitballing in the script room. It's like, well, now it's this. Why? I don't because I like Klingons better. As Leonard Nimoy said, the uh, Romulans are just evil Vulcans. They're not compelling, and can you imagine Christopher Lloyd as a Vulcan? It wouldn't. Be <laughs> you want to get that cool Phoenix knife? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or the Batleth. Well, that's been around. Or was that was that was a next gen, right? Did they start that? Yeah, the Batleth was next gen. The... Oh wait, no, because uh, was, was search no search for Sp- oh, well, I guess would that be around the same time as next gen? No, search for Spock was eighty five. Okay, so it pre or actually, yeah, because the Bat Batleth was in that, wasn't it? No, they had the that the. the Search for Spock. They had the knife where you press the button and the two jaws. Flew yeah, out. that's a Phoenix. Well, that's in real life. It's called a Phoenix knife. But that's the company oh. that makes it. But yeah, I yeah, it's the Klingon knife. Yeah. But the Batleth is like the curved, like martial arts looking yeah. weapon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was next generation only. Oh, okay. But yeah, no, the knife where you flick the switch and the two other things came out, which for some reason was scary, but it's like the main body of the knife what's going to kill you. Not, <laughs> not those little things that flick out, but it still looked evil. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that's a little wormholes I go down. Of. It's like I didn't realize what this was, and yet when I was younger, this was all cool to me. Um, and this is what it became. Uh, did you see the Red Letter Media guys thing? I think, I think it's called a review Star Trek Galaxy. Oh, where he pitches his own script. Yeah. <laughs> where it's like, it's called Galaxy because they're going after the original prototype of the Enterprise. The Galaxy. Because no one knows what the fuck happened to So Yeah, that guy's Star Trek lore is like insane. So yeah. <laughs> didn't know yeah he could he could pull like individual named episodes from next gen or like i can't fucking do that at all i I counter at waypoint it's like the only one i fucking remember it's the first fucking counter at far point oh far point i can see i can't even remember it i can do that with the original series too but only the good ones yeah uh i can pull all kinds of shit out of that but next generation no i like i don't I think I've so seen I'm try- I'm trying to... more than the next generation. So the uh, the the time displacement episode where they're playing poker, like that one I've seen like five times, and I, I that would be the one I would remember. I still can't remember the name of that episode. <laughs> Is that the one where they they're at war with the Klingons in the alternate universe? No, there's just that. Um... Because that, that that's the one with the Enterprise, like yeah. what the Enterprise uh, C or something, and yeah. then and then like Tasha Yar becomes an evil Romulan. Yeah. Um. No, this is one where just like a, um, like a spaceship just like kind of like hops out of time, and then like they have to try to like push themselves away from the spaceship, and they keep, uh, and yeah. they keep blowing each other up, and like that starts all over again. Yeah, because it's like the Bozeman. It's like a redressed Reliant ship. Yeah. And it keeps hitting their engine and causing the warp core and over and over and over again. The yeah. data in something in a numerical sequence through time. And yeah. And then when he plays poker, he ends up like sending the message to the, cause the, cause the way he shuffles the deck, it's like all threes or whatever. Yeah. And then he learns he has to like listen to Riker because Riker's like decompress a, uh, a shuttle bay three and that'll move us off because they keep trying to use the tractor and push it away and that always causes the problem. Right. I think the guy who played uh, Frazier was the captain of that ship. I believe so. Yeah, I know it's something weird. Like when they finally stop it from happening and they talk to him, it's like, oh, it's the guy from Cheer. But yeah, that ship that ship was like caught in a time loop for like ten years or something. It's like, now we've got some explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. There's there's some of those next generation ones stand out. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of them, but yeah, that was probably my favorite episode. And that was probably the one I just like accidentally seen like six times when, during syndication. Like, oh, this one's on. I'll just stop and watch this episode. I still like the one dark one they did where they never revisited it, where the parasites were taking people over. Yeah. 
and Picard and Riker just blow that guy apart with phasers and all these <laughs> parasites pop out of him. And they said, as a production staff, it's like, we'll never do another episode. Because that was, like, gory and violent. And yeah, that's some David Cronenberg shit. Died. Yeah, a lot of people died. And it's like, we'll never do another one like that. I do remember a few, but yeah, I, I did see the galaxy. Yeah, that was funny. Um, and actually, is it, they're not just a bad idea. Either. No, no, <laughs> it was not a bad idea. It's at all. it's basically the Red Letter Mia guys are speculating what this new Picard show will be, and they decided yeah. to just sit there and spitball the entire show. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah, do they do movies? Have they ever worked in movies? Yeah, they make their own movies. They make like horror type stuff. Right? Yeah, I mean, none of them are. Or like, I mean, the only one I've seen is funny, but it's not necessarily like a great movie. It's just like I like these guys, and they made a movie. But uh, Space Cop, that's one they made, and uh, Pat Patton Oswalt's actually in that. Um, I think you can only get their stuff like from their website. Like you can get oh. physical copies. I just bought it digitally, but like, you know, I don't think you can get their stuff like on demand. They made some horror movie that like got picked up, but like cable like on demand stuff <laughs> so you can right. catch one of their weird horror movies there yeah because they mostly make a lot of horror movies now they're kind of like comedy horror movies and or just comedy movies yeah they seem to be intensely knowledgeable about storytelling and crafting and how to film stuff and yeah it's, yeah they actually like make movies i don't know what like what they're doing currently because like they did space cop over like the course of like two years because there's a point in the uh, half in the bag episodes where they just had different sets because like they only have like this one warehouse they work in. So they can only have one set at a time. So they yeah. just like work that into the fiction of half in the bag. <laughs> and then I've been watching more of their, uh, cause Grayson likes those guys a lot. And I've been watching more of their best of the worst. And it's like, where do they fucking find this shit? People send it to <laughs> oh my God. This is some of the most obscure, bizarre shit I've ever heard of. Yeah, people just send them VHS tapes, and like they just have an entire library. They have like they have like fucking eighty copies of some movie called Nuke, and they've never watched it yet. <laughs> yeah, but fast as Star Trek, the role playing game, you'll never find it. <laughs> find it on Amazon. They want nine hundred dollars for some of the books, because some of them only saw one printing of like. A thousand copies, and oh, oh, the I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot to tell you the the other thing that pushed Paramount over the edge was the the Star Trek Marines uh, Federation Marines ground combat because they were gonna do like a, a ground combat grid games with the Federations with uh, photon mortars or photon <laughs> flurry, and it was like. Uh, yeah, that was another, and those elements never existed. This was just FASA trying to get into the tabletop gaming. Um, that was another one where they said, "No, this is not Star Trek. This is something." And because uh, they had like uh, assault phaser rifles, which actually looked cool. I've seen some preliminary designs, and it's like, oh, the people in the movie should have taken a look at these because these are much better than the ones that they came up with for the. Because remember the. They could never do rifles right on Star Trek, uh, either yeah. next gen or any of them. Because well, the ones they did for, well, the, the, yeah, they're always kind of just big pieces of plastic. But like the what they did for uh, First Contact, because like all that stuff in First Contact, they brought into the the video game for the Voyager Elite Forces. They kind of like okay. it's like this is the because that's where they you know Elite Forces really just. You know, d did what this is doing it's like let's have a grenade let's have a star trek grenade and a star trek uh rifle and a star trek rocket launcher <laughs> yeah, micro photon torpedo yeah it was like their bfg yeah <laughs> which that's not a gun i would hold and fire <laughs> oh it has antimatter in it yeah let's fuck around with this let's see where this gets us yeah so that's that's my uh, obscure thing. That yeah, that's three weeks in the making there, folks. <laughs> Enjoy that one. Uh, but, well, hey, we're at the two hour mark. All right, that means time to drink cough syrup and go to sleep. <laughs>
to a cold and deep sleep, and maybe you'll wake up from it. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll, because I have tons of things I can talk about, but uh, this last thing I'll end on is Maniac, the uh, new Netflix show. Oh, yeah, yeah, you were telling me about this. Jonah Hill and uh, Emma Stone, directed by Kerry Fujinaki, which I think that's his name, uh, the guy who did the first season of True Detective. Okay. Uh, and he also directed Beasts of No Nation, and he uh, uh, worked on and then left the It movie. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember why, but he still wrote the script for that. Um, so yeah, this is a, it's like a, uh, now why I think you'll really like it is cause I know you, you have an affection for like those eighties Ridley or I guess 79 alien and blade runner, like uh design aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is more, more alien. Like essentially the lab in the movie is just the Nostromo. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> a lot of like gridded corridors and pipes. And... Yes. Okay. Uh, a lot of CRTs and stuff like that. It's basically like a future, like there's future technology, like better than we have now, but it's like nobody discovered flat screens. Like that's, pr- that's pretty much what's going on here or transistors. Like everything's big and bulky, but it's like the future, but it's now, you know, it's, it's weird. Uh, yes. There's a weird thing called ad buddy, which you don't know. You don't, figure out what that is until like the second episode but it's like if you can't pay for anything because there's like because they have a lot of automation so there's a lot of just huge amounts of displacement where like just nobody has a job okay and there's this thing called ad buddy where it's like if you can't pay for something like i need to ride the train i don't have any money it's like use ad buddy and then like ad buddy is just like it's just a dude with a suitcase is like with pamphlets it's like here's a job you can get and it's like if you just like suffer through that dude offering you jobs you can ride the train for free <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> watch this ad before your video plays yes right. in life <laughs> okay um uh, the main crux of the of the of the show is a uh is a drug trial where a guy is essentially trying to eliminate uh psychology through drugs it's like you don't need you don't need a, you don't need a therapist or psychology at all you just take these drugs and then you'll be good you'll your the drugs and technology will handle it okay yeah no therapy just yeah yeah uh and uh and so they go into this lab and there's a lot of weird equipment and everything and they and there's three trials of the drugs so there's like a i think it's a b and c um and so when they take the first drug, they kind of like everybody, ha- you know, has like a dream. But like Emma Stone and Jonah Hill, their two characters end up in the same exact dream. Like they have a shared dream from this drug trial. Okay. Um, and I believe in the in the first dream, it's them like being faced with what their problem is mentally. Uh, and then the other trials, it gets very whimsical where it's like, it's, they don't even play the same characters. It's like a completely different world. Uh, there's even like fantasy world and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's pretty fun. Very weird. Huh? Um, so I, th- I think you'll enjoy, you'll at least enjoy a lot of the aesthetics of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, and it has a weird blend of, of, of humor and drama. That's kind of, a that the well, I wouldn't say off putting, it's just it's just what makes it weird. Yeah. So. That sounds kind of interesting. Looks like kind of it has an unreliable narrator vibe where you don't know exactly if what you're seeing is what's really going on. Um I mean I'm just looking at stills from the movie. You know when there's I I mean I I mean maybe that's that's a maybe well, that's a, one of the characters has mental illness and it's advertised it's like oh okay so we're going to get a skewed version of reality that's going to snap into focus in the last episode or something there's some of that in the beginning but at some point like when they're in the drug trial you know what's reality i don't think they ever you you for him there's like you you are uh, you are cautious of like Okay, if is what he is seeing real, yeah. you you are cautious of that, but that's not really a main point of it. Um, um, 
it's 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 a lot of the like the shared dream sequences and stuff like that and then the interaction between when they get back to reality and then there's other characters too like the science the weird scientist guy and and the reason he created um this drug to begin with um, okay which is like his mother was a psychologist and then like i guess she used to have like you know real purpose in the psychological community but then just became a pop psychologist and sold out oh okay <laughs> and so he's like so angry at his mother he's just going to eliminate psychology <laughs> okay i have goals i have a passion all right all right. Well, this week for the American Greed Factory podcast, this is Nathan. This is Colin. Goodbye, America.